The hottest videos are now only at Burger King. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Four never-before-released tapes for only $3.49 each. Cool. To get the hottest videos, sometimes you've got to break the rules. There is something about this that's altogether too ironic. People complained about the first live-action movie in 1990, and Secret of the Ooze was made. People complain about the 2014 movie, and this flick was made. There's just uh, one slight difference. As goofy as Secret of the Ooze got, at least I have the absolute respect to wear a t-shirt of it. Hmm. It's a shame I had to end EMNT e Movie Week this way. With the 2014 reboot being a success, unexpectedly, a sequel was greenlit. Unfortunately, I avoided it pretty hard like the plague, given how I felt about the 2014 reboot. Nothing. And I mean absolutely nothing sold me into it. Even the trailer itself didn't really do much for me, despite the fact it teased certain elements that were being utilized from 1987 cartoon that so many people wanted to see on the big screen since 1991. But hey, don't take my word for it. Critics felt it was an improvement over the 2014 film, yet audiences disagreed. Out of the Shadows flopped hard the box office, and so many people questioned why something so good went so wrong. Hmm. I wonder the same too, and I think I know exactly the answers. I will start off and say there are some positives I do have. They don't save the experience, but they are worth mentioning. Instead of Jonathan Leavesman returning to direct the sequel, we get David Green, who helmed Herf to Echo. So, it looks and feels like a traditional movie, and not someone trying to mimic Michael Bay's style, despite the fact that Michael Bay is still there producing it. It does seem the complaints from the first movie are heard, as the drills appear slightly redesigned, but not by much. They are still the ugly digital counterparts, but they look less bulky and at least watchable here. Same goes for Splinter, who looks more tolerable than he was in the last film. I still don't know how to feel about Tony Shalhoub voicing him, but he's okay, I guess. A good leader understands this. A good brother accepts it. Hairy Japanese bastards! <laughs> Very much everyone is trying to create a fun ride with some interesting action set pieces, and I admit to laughing at some of the jokes. <laughs> the good news is, you're wearing shoes. Shoes? The bad news is, Okay, so not really by how it's written, but the delivery and editing help them at best. However, all of that positivity flow stops here, because in my opinion, this sequel is truly terrible. How terrible, you ask? Well, it's not the worst of the film franchise. That honor still goes to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3. At least I can see where the potential lies here in certain elements and ideas, but something feels a little off here. 
I believe that the main focus here was trying to latch on to two basic things. Further develop the relationship with the Turtles, and trying to please the diehard fans. Yeah, that worked pretty well, didn't it? And nowhere near is that more clear than in the plot. Or in this case, plots. Shredder this time around is played by Chicago Med's Brian T. and not some shadowy figure kept in the dark. He teams with Baxter Stockman for reasons as the wacky scientist tries to help him break out. During the process, Shredder is teleported to another dimension and meets Krang, who gives exposition and a plan to take over the world by finding a device to teleport Krang to their world. In return, the alien brain gives Shredder a mutagen who uses it to create two mutant henchmen to battle against the turtles. In between that, you get the turtles fighting each other over if they're working as a team and debating about wanting to be among the world above, April O'Neil just being there, Vern fighting New Glory as the savior of the city, covering up for the turtles' heroism, and perhaps the worst incarnation of Casey Jones I have seen to date. <laughs> Yeah, there's uh, quite a lot to process here. On one hand, it's good for them to listen to the fans and do what they can to entertain them, but in some cases that can kind of backfire. You see, the idea here is that it's more than just our expectations of seeing Krang on the big screen, but more or less a certain incarnation that we are used to seeing. And Granted, some things are going to be lost in translating something from the small screen to the big one, but that's to be expected. Though here it doesn't do quite favors when said character's existence is only to translate one person to another to get to this plot point to the next. In short, what we see here is a matter of scenes happening with little character depth or weight to it. For example, Krang's introduction just exists for motivation and to get the plot going. There's no proper scene to present who he is. Krang is just there to toss out this jargon an enthusiast would probably get. But to a normal moviegoer, they would be lost in knowing what a Technodrome is or why this is going on. I swear you can almost hear Shredder's inner thoughts as this scene plays. Because you and your buddy, Dr. Stockman, found something to buy. The teleportation device. It will open a portal through which I can bring my war machine, the Technodrome! What? Take this. It will solve all your problems with those pests. What the hell is this? Joking aside, I'm more baffled Shredder's just going along with this like it's a normal thing instead of just freaking out like a normal guy would. Also, much respect to Brian T. He seems to have the menace of the character down, but it feels weird to leave him unmasked for a duration of the movie, aside from the end. In fact, Shredder is such a non-entity that he doesn't do much. He doesn't fight the turtles or feel like an actual threat. He's just there to do certain actions in order to get Krang into the climax. Hell, they fridge Shredder! Once he gets Krang out of Dimension X, the alien freezes him, and that's it! Back in the toy chest with the rest of the things I've broken! <laughs> Seriously, ask yourself this question. Out of all the villains in the rogue gallery of this franchise, who is the number one that has the most connections to the Turtles? Easy! The Shredder! And to see him get used like this and tossed aside like he's a big pile of nothing, it's just aggravating that you know so much of the history behind this character. And yeah, that is Brad Garrett as the voice of Krang. I guess he's... Okay, but he's not given much to do given his scenes bookend the movie. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I get a little tentacle mucus in your eyes? Seriously, you could just cut him completely out and little to nothing would change. Or if you somehow restructured the film in some shape or form and removed Krang out of the picture, you'd see how much he's of a nothing entity here. Speaking of wasteful characters, we get our first big screen take on Bebop and Rocksteady, played by Gary Anthony Williams and Seamus. Big fan of your work, especially your early stuff. My name is Bebop. This is Rocksteady. I know it's a crazy name, right, but his ancestors are from Finland. Admittingly, I liked them. Before they got mutated. 
it's hard to describe, but casting-wise, yeah, I can see this working. Williams and Sheamus really have the chemistry nailed early on, and they're kind of fun to watch. You know, babes, I'm tired of being someone else's errand boy. Carve out our own piece of the city. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe even start our own foot clan. Once they get mutated into their animal forms, it starts to go downhill. They become such a nuisance to the point, I become ready to put the movie on mute when they appear on screen. The CGI designs are cool, but on the other hand, when they talk... Do I look fat to you? Fat? Oh, no, buddy, no. You look... Really fast! Yes, we did it, we did it! We got that super important thing, you kind of hard thing to find. Look, thing. Move your head away, you gotta see me. Hey, boss! It all started with the Big Bang. Yeah, beeps? Well, I got a Big Bang for you. <laughs> oh. Shut <laughs> up! You know, it's funny. Eastman and Laird really put their foots down to have Bebop and Roxy included in Secret of the Ooze. And in hindsight, I can clearly see why here. In the 87 cartoon, they can be stupid and easy to foil, but they didn't make fart jokes, do gross stuff, or <laughs> prance around in the background doing dumb things. Wake up, you slime buckets! Oh, mommy, do I have to go to school? And get off my buttons! And even in the show, they could actually be a true threat to the turtles. And I feel bad because I know these two actors can be fun, and it's clear they're trying to make most of the material they are given work. But the execution just makes them come off as two drunk bros that would rather joke around than do anything. Granted, there's one funny line I did snicker at. Honestly, I don't know if it's because of Anthony's delivery of that line, but there was just something about it that was kind of funny to me. Less so when they do juvenile stuff like this. <gasps> My My man. This confuses me. Are they pleased by the idea that their schlongs got bigger? Or the fact that they have animal genitals? Is it because their pants got bigger? No, 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 I, I, I shouldn't question it. There's already way too much junk to analyze here. It boggles the mind. Oh, remember how Casey Jones was such an enjoyable treat first time around? Let's take all that and make him a whiny guy that wants to be a detective. Even the Chris Pine version was far more than tolerable. That was certainly more Casey Jones than Stefan Amell's take here. It's weird because when you see him as Arrow, it does make sense why they would cast Amell for this role. Last time I was down here, I saved your life. Do you really think that gives you a pass for serving up William to Damien Dark? But my only takeaway is that the writing doesn't give him any favors. Instead of a vigilant badass, he's just some hockey-playing wiener that is too naive. Take this moment for example when he tries to get information out of a bartender. You know what? I love this song. You mind if I borrow this, do you? Hey! It has a scratch on it! Damn it! Or maybe I'll have a drink. Are you out of your mind? Get in there. First off, exactly what bar of this design and state would actually have Ice Ice Baby on their jukebox? being rhetorical. Down, 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 down. Hmm. Second, the bartender here is played by Dean Winters, a man who's very well known for playing gruff and tough characters. And to see someone as scrappy and light as Mel here in the role of Casey Jones try to intimidate Dean Winters is truly unrealistic. It clearly shows that maybe Dean Winters should have been Casey Jones, or hell, Will Arnett. There's just something about this one scene that truly shows exactly the casting is way off here. When you have someone like Dean Winters, a person who can do tough and gruff characters, being intimidated by one who is so much younger and could get easily pummeled. 
Oh, and there's a subplot where Casey wants to be a detective and is constantly dumped on by his superiors for his behavior. So naturally, he takes the law into his own hand. Thanks for your statement, Jones. That's Officer Jones. And I'm gonna be a detective someday. I'm just waiting for the next round of applications at the Academy. Oh, gee. Yeah, could have taken the path of the vigilante who wants to take matters under his own hands, or the bitchy princess. And in this case, you chose the bitchy princess. Speaking of arguments, the turtles seem crossed between living under New York or trying to fit in with the world above constant theme that was done better in other incarnations. Of course, all of New York wouldn't be accepting to four mutated reptiles. What do you think will happen? However, this whole stay in the shadows starts to get eyebrows raised the moment you see them rocket skateboard over New York to get a pizza and drive a dump truck in the first action scene that shoots out manholes and has mechanical nunchucks sticking out. <laughs> Seriously, take your out of the shadows and cram it firmly into your shell. How is this not drawing attention when you're constantly saying that your goal is to be hidden, yet you're doing things that really seem to be drawing attention, but they don't? Look, I know it's a movie and I shouldn't take it seriously, but there are limits to what one does when crossing between a cartoon and a live action reality. If this movie was established to be more of a cartoon or fantasy environment that was self-aware, I would be fine. Uh, but there's not much of a hint of that. But once Krang's Nugent comes into play, we also get this subplot. It could turn us into humans. We don't need that kind of change. You can't say a word of this to the others. Wow. Okay, I know Leonardo can be a bit of a thick head and kind of a jerk in past incarnations, but all this takes it to a new level. This is straight up douche. Why not have the turtles debate about this ooze and see what types of possibilities it can provide? Yeah, it's a plot element that comes out of the blue and leads to many ideas to explore. Like, maybe the turtle's living among the humans, or something like that. Instead, it's used as a plot element to test the limits of how they work as a team with Leonardo, being a straight-up jerk and taking control, as opposed to talking it over with everyone. Be cautious with the path you are choosing, because you're really starting to make me reconsider about Leonardo being a complete dick in TMNT. Don't make me do this! Also, the only reason for this to exist is to get Raphael and Michelangelo to break into police headquarters, as they have the canister of Krang's ooze under contraband, just so they could get discovered by the police. I kinda like how Raphael suddenly knows the ooze is there without any knowledge prior. In fact, it's kinda the best way to describe this sequel. Characters just randomly know information, or just say they do. I can buy Baxter Stockman knowing who the turtles are, given Shredder would probably have to mention that information to him at some point off screen, more than April O'Neil knowing so much information about Stockman working with Shredder after obtaining some digital files only to see that there's a code included into them that causes them to be deleted. Either she is good at speed reading, or she took a really good effort just absorbing that information with such little time. How did you get here so fast? We used the plot device! Hello. Oh, and want to know how that whole turtles wanting to be human or not subplot gets resolved? Me. 
no discussion, no talk, nobody gets final say about this whole thing. Literally, this whole plot element is just chucked out the window, just like that. The one thing that was keeping them together as a team, and it's just spat. What a wasted opportunity. And surprised as I am to admit, Tyler Perry's Baxter Stockman nearly saves the experience. For those who know me, I'm not a fan of Tyler Perry's work, and even when I heard of his casting here, I couldn't separate him from Medea given how overexposed that franchise is. Yet, credit where credit is due, Tyler Perry is a good actor. I see him in Gone Girl, Alex Cross, and other features where he does give his 110%. And here, it took some time getting used to the performance, but he makes it his own. Yeah, I can joke around and say how it's very Sherman clumpy, but Perry is clearly having a good time with the role of an eccentric scientist. In a way, I kind of think he should have been the main driving force and not Shredder. It would have cut back on some complex narrative contrivances and simplified some stuff. I can buy Baxter Stockman being more sold on Krang's plan than Shredder given the energetic performance and his will to do things like create new mutants without any rational moral thought. I can see him using Bebop and Rocksteady more because he's just brain and he needs some brawn. The only way I see this movie working more is if they cut Shredder out and made Baxter Stockman the center of it all. But, uh, nope. Stockman is fridge too. By means of being stuffed into a car and sent off to a sequel that probably never will be. Given the comics, it's quite a shame, given how I'm glad to see we got our first Blackster Stockman. Not even the antics of Will Arnett as Vern can save this movie, as he takes in his newfound appreciation of being a fake savior to New York. Yeah, he's got funny moments like plans to sell bags of his own breath for a quick buck, but it's mostly from Arnett's performance than anything else written. The special effects this time around are better, and certainly are staged better compared to the first film. I do like how they combine practical sets with digital work, which is impressive for the most part to see the turtle's lair or the interiors of the turtle van, but even there are times when it feels like there's too much of a reliance on digital effects. Sure, some stuff like Bebop and Rock City picking out on some spaghetti and meatballs, I can kind of understand that, but are we really that lazy to the point we need to digitally create a slice of pizza for just a slipping gag? It's pizza. Overall, they really tried to please the viewers with this one, but man, did it backfire. From the Easter eggs to even the deleted cameo by Jude of Hope for the 1990 movie, it doesn't do much. The stuff they set up go nowhere, and characters just exist to move a plot that doesn't feel fleshed out. There's interesting ideas for a turtle sequel, but it never fully comes together. It may have some good action scenes, but that's about it. The execution is rubbish, and unfortunately, out of the shadows, is just a waste of time. And so, that's it for TMNT Movie Week. It's kind of a shame I had to close out with Out of the Shadows, but if there's any other way to end this more positively, it's this. It was nice to revisit the movies again. Even if one was bad, there was still something I had to offer. I can't think of a single film that provided nothing in return. They all stood out in their own way. And after the third movie in 1993, no one would expect this franchise would continue within any shape or form. We all thought it was just going to be a one-and-done fad, but it stuck around longer than expected. And globally, for that matter, too. Last year, there was a really good friend of mine that was going through tough times, so out of the kindness of my heart, I got her action figures of her two characters from this franchise, Leonardo and Michelangelo. You know what? She loves them so much, she has them perched over her desk. So while she's doing her artwork, or what have you, they're protecting her bedroom no matter what. That's the interesting thing about this franchise. It doesn't die. It continues in some shape, form, or incarnation to be loved by another generation, or even those around the world. No matter what incarnation that we get, they will always continue in some shape or form while still being loved by their audience for how they remember it. 
As of right now, a new animated movie is upon us and promises to take the turtles in different directions while also trying out some new things. It looks promising for the most part, and I look forward to seeing it no matter how good or bad it will be. Regardless of what incarnation we get, we still have the turtles, the way we remember them, and how we were exposed to them. The memory always remains. And to think, it all started with two comic book creators that just had a simple idea and ran with it. They never know it was going to go this far. It was done not for the toys, the TV show, the movies, the fame, or what other merchandising license exists out there. They believed in the idea, it went forth, look at how far it's come. Seriously. Just say it. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You can't say it with a straight face. There's just something about those four words that brings a smile to you when you say it. So glad that episodic marathon's over with it. this turtle mania going on, I tried my hand at making those ninja turtle pies I saw back in your Secret of the Ooze review. Care for a try? Knowing your mindset, there's just one tiny thing I must ask. Are those really made? from actual turtle. Say what?